compromise is built into the Constitution. And in a way, compromise with evil is built into the Constitution because there is no clear sense from the Constitution of whether slavery should be allowed or should not be allowed. That members of the founding generation determined was the only way to put the country together. It created a situation that I think people still believe today that, well, because the founders said it, it can't be wrong. And as a result, African Americans have been battling even for the most fundamental equality before the law and, and still are. Conflict over slavery continues. And in 1854, there is more interest in organizing new territory in that former area known as the Louisiana Purchase. And Lincoln's rival in Illinois, Stephen Douglas, a Democrat, wants to help get this territory organized. And so in 1854, he proposes something that comes to be known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. What he wants to do is apply something called popular sovereignty to this new territory. Popular sovereignty actually was something that was part of the Compromise of 1850. New territory that came in, in New Mexico and Utah had been prescribed as using popular sovereignty to determine whether slavery would exist in their borders. It was the idea that the people rule, the people are sovereign. But in this particular case, it was applied to mean that the people of the territory would be able to vote whether slavery would exist in their borders. So this existed in the Compromise of 1850, and Douglas set out to apply it to Kansas and Nebraska. The Kansas-Nebraska Act caused a hell of a storm. It repealed the Missouri Compromise. That territory that had been free was now open to the idea of popular sovereignty. The white people who moved there would vote either yes or no, will we have slavery or not? You have Northerners and Southerners flocking into Kansas, trying to make it either slave or free. And in the process, they bludgeon one another through a time we know as Bleeding Kansas. Lincoln saw the Kansas-Nebraska Act as rooted in violence, violence to the Constitution, violence to the principles of compromise that earlier generations of Americans had settled in 1820. He saw it as an overthrow of a compromise that had been intended to make the Union last and that had worked for more than 30 years. Lincoln wrote a private letter to his closest friend, Joshua Speed, in 1855. And speaking about the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he said, I look upon that enactment not as a law, but as violence from the beginning. It was conceived in violence, passed in violence, is maintained in violence, and is being executed in violence. Now, Stephen Douglas argued that the Kansas-Nebraska Act was rooted in popular sovereignty, this is democracy, this is how it works. But Lincoln pointed out that what was really going on was that white people were voting to decide how to govern black people. And that is not government by consent. That is despotism, Lincoln said, when one group of people gets to vote and decide how they are gonna govern another. In 1857, Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney of Maryland rules in a seven to two decision, two things. One, that Dred Scott and his family, he is an enslaved black man from Missouri, cannot sue in a federal court, ought not to have sued at the lower circuit court level because he is either a slave or a descendant of slaves. Taney made the point that it was race, not slavery that determined one's citizenship in this country. And so, Tawny first rules that Dred Scott didn't have a right to sue in a federal court because he's a black man. Second thing he went on to say that wasn't relevant to that particular decision. He didn't need to go on to say this, but the second thing he ruled was that Congress in 1820 acted unconstitutionally when it crafted the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Our practice historically had been that Congress could do this. So when Tawny says, uh, they shouldn't have done it, they didn't have that right. They didn't have that power. Lincoln is horrified by the Dred Scott decision, as many people are. At the same time, 
the Supreme Court does not have the same kind of power in the 19th century that it does today. And so many people simply ignored the Supreme Court. They said, we don't agree, we're not going to go along with this. Uh, they engaged in all kinds of nullification of this idea. Certain states even passed laws and passed pronouncements invalidating the Dred Scott decision. But Lincoln knew the power of this decision because of course Southerners were constantly claiming that this decision was the right decision. So Lincoln responded by saying that the Supreme Court simply does not have that power. Lincoln repeats this about the Supreme Court many times, and he refers to Dred Scott in these terms of being, you know, just one decision by this court and not the true pronouncement of how American society should operate. And he gives probably the best encapsulation of this in his first inaugural address. And he says, if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the Supreme Court, the people have ceased to become their own rulers. And, and this is such an important point, right? Because he is saying, yes, the Supreme Court made this decision. However, we are the people. We are the people who get to decide what our constitution means. In the Dred Scott decision, Roger Tawney had said that the state of life for African-Americans had improved between 1787 when the Constitution was written and 1857 when the Dred Scott decision was handed down. And Lincoln responded by saying that that assertion was based on assumed historical facts that were not really true. And Lincoln showed how the state of being for African Americans had gotten worse over that time period. In the 1770s and 1780s, African Americans could vote in many states. The right to vote was restricted on account of how much property you had in most of the states, the original 13 colonies and original states, not based on the color of your skin. It was only in the 1820s and 1830s that that right to vote was stripped away from black men in the states and then was denied to black men in new states. And so Lincoln pointed out, contrary to Tawney's position, that black men were losing rights over this period of time. Life was not getting better. In the early days of the American Republic, states could abolish slavery within their borders if they wanted to. But in the 1830s, in the aftermath of Nat Turner's rebellion, some states decided to prohibit owners from freeing their slaves. And so Lincoln points out that things are actually worse for African Americans now in 1857 than they were when the Constitution was written in 1787. And so he goes to Springfield and then Peoria and delivers these addresses where he calls on Americans to stick to the principles of the founding. At one point in the speech, he says, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. And he calls on Americans to repurify that Republican robe, to wash it clean, to cling back to the principles of the American Revolution and to the idea that slavery was on the path to ultimate extinction. This is my favorite Lincoln document. It comes from Proverbs. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. And what's interesting to me about this is, this is just a fragment of something that he wrote and we don't have the beginning. And I can tell you what my interpretation is, which is that the apple of gold is the Declaration of Independence. He, he, he says so himself. But judging from everything else he's ever said about the Declaration of Independence, he's specifically talking about equality among human beings, that all human beings are equally endowed by their creator with the right to be alive, the right to be free, and the right to pursue happiness. And slavery has no part in this. <laughs>